It is the 12th of March 2004, and emergency workers are exploring a wasteland of destruction. Multiple houses have been obliterated, vehicles and boats smashed and strewn across the landscape. These photographs weren't from a war zone or aftermath of a natural disaster. They were taken in Mississippi, and 14,200 acre feet of water has rushed through the region. Amazingly, no one has died in this miles long dog's dinner of a disaster. But what was the cause? Well, if the video title didn't give it away, it was from a common subject on this channel a sudden and dramatic dam failure. Welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today we're looking at the rather aptly named Big Bay Dam Disaster. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my YouTube, Patreon, and Kofi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, but you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. Damn, that's a damn damn. Our story goes all the way back to the year 1990, and the plans are being laid down for a new dam. This is Lamar County, Mississippi, United States. It has a modest population of around 60,000 people spread across a number of towns and settlements. The whole point of the new dam was to create a recreational lake by impounding runoff from the local water basin across the Bay Creek Basin. The lake was roughly 945 acres, turning, as we can see on this satellite image, from this to this, making a pretty impressive man-made body of water. The dam would take just around a year to complete, opening in 1991, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. It's time for our video sponsor. I'm just kidding. But we do actually have to talk about the dam's design, don't we? The dam was an earthen fill type and was made up of four main sections, originally penned in the mid-1980s. Underneath the dam, there was an undercutting of the in-situ soils to remove any soft compressible soils and unsuitable materials to get to the firmer clayly sands. This varied in depth, but at its deepest point was 6 feet, or around 1.8 metres, below the base of the intended dam. On top of this, native clay sands were placed. This would create the bulk of the dam structure. These were installed over 47 lifts. To make up the central core of the structure, a benetonite modified soil and clay sand was made, ranging from 8 to 16 feet in width. This wall extended down below the excavated section and nearly reached the top of the total embankment height. To complete the structure's main elements, compacted soil was added to make up the embankment skin. Width-wise, the dam was 40 feet at the top and 363-ish feet at the base. Now, on the reservoir side, a wave berm was installed and on top of the embankment, a 20-foot roadway was also laid. So in order to not have your dam be swept away, you need a few ways to release and control water flow. Let's see how the Big Bay Dam did this. Right, so first of all, the dam had an emergency earthen spillway on its east abutment. This was 200 feet wide and was only really intended for use if the dam was overfilled from, say, excessive flood or rainwaters. Thus, it was not really used regularly to control the reservoir level. This was done by the principal spillway, which was roughly in the middle of the dam. This consisted of a concrete riser and discharge box culvert controlled by a 48 inch slide gate. The downstream face of the dam had tow and slope drains for assisting in removing any precipitation along the embankment as well as any water seepage. But vitally the dam didn't have any real form of monitoring system. Not surprising as the architects apparently weren't really known for dam designs. Anyways, as I mentioned earlier the dam was completed in 1991 reaching its normal pool depth in 1993, creating Mississippi's largest privately held lake. Almost as soon as the reservoir was established, issues would plague the project. Wet spots were noticed on the downstream face, along with weeping of water at, at changing places throughout the structure. Remediation works were undertaken to add more drainage, but a few years later, more seepage would be discovered around the culvert outlet, requiring more remediation works in 1999. In 2002, a sinkhole was discovered and backfilled. In response to this, an engineer was hired to annually inspect the dam. And this would fix everything, 
and that's the end of the video. Oh, damn it. The disaster. It is the 11th of March 2004, and at around 3pm, a maintenance man noticed an increase of muddy contaminated water that was flowing out of one of the dam's drain pipes. Something untoward was happening. The owner was informed, who then informed the retained engineer, but they would not reach the dam until the next morning. On the next day, the 12th of March 2004, inspections of the drain found it was leaking muddy water out and noted that the reservoir pool was just under 8 inches above normal levels. The muddy flow was estimated to be around a half to one gallon US gallon per minute. Around lunchtime, the maintenance worker noticed seepage from an area 20 to 30 feet southwest of the drain pipe discharge location. He called the engineer, and both men observed muddy water spraying up into the sky. Rapid erosion had set in on the north side of the dam, i.e. the water-facing section. The emergency plan for the site was activated, as a full breach was looking ever more likely. A section of the dam's material was observed to be experiencing localised liquefaction. Parts of the dam were acting more like fluid than a solid. By 12.25pm, the erosion rapidly had grown and progressed upstream, resulting in a breach, releasing 14,200 acre-feet of water onto the creek below. As the following hour pressed on, more and more of the dam was washed away, increasing the breach width to over 200 feet by 1.20pm. The normal pool level was down by 16 feet, and by 3.40pm the lake bed was empty. The concrete spillway and culverts had been completely removed during the breach. The effluents ran down onto the few houses downstream. In fact, over a hundred houses would be caught up in the disaster, 48 of which would be completely destroyed, with a similar number receiving different levels of damage. On top of that, a fire station, two churches and a bridge would receive significant damage, as well as around 30 roads being affected. Luckily, due to an emergency evacuation pre-breach, no one would die in the deluge of water, which means I can smash this button. Lawsuits unsurprisingly would follow, resulting in a $1 million settlement with homeowners. The dam would be rebuilt after being given approval in 2007, costing over $6 million. As we can see on Google Earth, the new dam is pretty similar to the original, albeit hopefully with better drainage and water management. But before any new structure could be built, the cause had to be found out, which leads us into the many case studies into the disaster. The Investigation So the owners of the dam, Land Partners Limited, commissioned a consulting engineer company based in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to undertake and produce a report on the probable cause of the failure. They looked into the dam's design, as well as interviewing the engineer and maintenance worker getting their eyewitness statements about the events leading up to the disaster. This brought to light the liquefaction of the section of the dam shortly before its total failure, around the same point as the initial brown water discharge was noticed. This had hinted that the water was entering the embankment seeping into its core structure. The report was prepared and released by the end of April. It posited that the cause of the failure was from water seepage, as stated in the report's conclusion. In summary, it is my conclusion that the most probable cause of failure development was combined mechanisms of the initial unexpected collapse of the ground structure around the seep point, leading to the critical shortening of the seepage path beneath the cutoff wall, the result of which was the erosion and collapse of the embankment structure from within. This would hint that the structure did not have an adequate drainage to allow seepage to safely leave the structure, thus being a design shortcoming. Warning signs were there right from the start, especially in 2002 when the sinkhole was appeared and filled in. The disaster would yield many more case studies, for example in re-examination of the 2004 failure of Big Bay, Mississippi by Keith A. Ferguson et al. would conclude three causes for the failure. Number 1. Beginning with design and construction deficiencies associated with the cutoff wall and seepage control features. Two. Erosion and piping through deficits in the outlet conduit. And finally, number three, a rapid progression formation followed by a final cycle of erosion. Later 3D modelling of the dam would also develop this further, where rapid transmissions of high water pressure around the seepage areas resulted in the localised liquefaction, 
which then caused the explosive and sudden failure point. Basically, the pressures that the dam was subjected to had nowhere to really dissipate to, via a safe escape route like proper drainage. Eventually, it all had to go somewhere, thus weakening the dam's embankment to the point of failure. So that's my video on the Big Bay Dam failure. Thankfully, it's going to be a two on my scale, mainly due to the minimal human cost. And this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plainly Foot production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like License. Plainly Foot videos produced by me, John. They're currently not too bad, corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Missy Music, play us out, please.